What's the most valuable Alfa Romeo ever? What's the one that sold for the most? Oh, the 100% is the AC2900. Okay. Uh, and 30 were built. Hey guys, Roman here. Welcome to Milan and uh, the Alfa Romeo Museum. And you're about to get a guided tour. It's not that deep. Uh, that uh, we're doing through the museum, uh, which is uh, for us here because we're here about to drive the new Alfa Romeo uh, Tonale. Uh, but the night before, they're giving us a little bit of a guided tour of the museum. So, uh, welcome to an insider's video, what it's like to be an automotive journalist. Welcome to the Alfa Romeo Museum. Just a few words about this place. This place was open the first time, I can say, in 1976. It was one of the first uh, European company museums, uh, speaking about cars. And uh, for sure, it was uh, one of the uh, first visions that the company had, because Alfa Romeo started collecting old cars uh, already uh, in the early 50s, when some of them were still available as used cars, uh, just uh, in the magazines. Uh, in 1956, uh, Alfa Romeo decided to open this new plant here in Arese, uh, after the big plant of Milano downtown was too, too small for the post-war production. And uh, uh, at first they decided to put a museum in front of a headquarter. For 40 years, the museum was uh, actually a um, visitable collection, but not open to the public. And then finally, in 2015, uh, we completely refurbished it, passing from uh, uh, 5,000 guests per year to 100,000 visitors per year. Obviously, uh, changing the situation this way uh, uh, requires some differences in the display. So the museum is no longer just a chronological display, but is now uh, working around three sections that are also three values of the brand. One is the history. We have now uh, living our uh, 113th year of history. Uh, the second is the bellezza. It's the only word we are not translating in English because bellezza is, uh, is not beauty. It's something much deeper and wider than beauty. And then the third section uh, is dedicated to speed, velocità, so motorsport and driving pleasure. So uh, let's start with our quick tour so you can uh, see some of our cars. Now the museum collection is uh, of uh, 287 cars, 72 are in permanent display while the other are in our storage, we call it collezione area. We will have a look at the end of the tour. Uh, and uh, we use this uh, uh, big amount of uh, spare cars, I can say, to organize temporaries uh, and to speak about uh, other uh, particular themes. Uh, and uh, in this temporary, we are displaying some of the hidden treasures of the museum. For instance, the prototype of the Giulia, uh, four years before the presentation, the, the car of the Pope, uh, the Darak that uh, represents the origins of Alfa Romeo, and many other mm, uh, pieces of history. But in this uh, first part of the museum, we can also speak about uh, the origins of the Alfa Romeo logo. Alfa Romeo logo, uh, legend says that was uh, one of the designers uh, uh, looking at the castle of Milano, uh, noticed the cross and the snake. Actually, Milano is full of cross and snakes because the cross is the symbol of the municipality, while the snake is the symbol of the Visconti family. And when, uh, in 1910, they decided to open a new company, they decided to use the two symbols of the city to, uh, to create the logo. Uh, obviously, there is also the name Alfa, that means Anonima Lombarda Fabrica Automobili, uh, that is the legal entity of the, of the company, and Milano. The two knots uh, are the symbol of the Savoy family, so the, the family of Italian Kingdom. And if you see the transformation of the logo through the years, uh, every big transformation uh, represents something. Uh, Alfa Romeo, when Nicola Romeo took the control of the company during the First World War, uh, the crown around the logo was added in 1925 when Alfa Romeo won the first Grand Prix Car World Championship, that now is more or less Formula One. And uh, in 1946, uh, when Italy became a republic, the two knots disappeared. The last big transformation uh, is uh, in 1972, going forward, that uh, uh, we have the logo without uh, the Milano because uh, uh, a new plant was opened in the south of Italy, in Pomigliano d'Arco, where there is the tonale production now. On the other side, you can see also uh, an important chapter of Alfa history regarding the uh, avio engine production. Uh, 
we can speak a lot about uh, these uh, engines, but uh, the most important number is uh, 1938, when the 85% of the money arrived from the aircraft engine production. And uh, in that period, uh, Alpha was basically an aeronautic company with uh, only a small, more or less 250 cars per year production. The cars are uh, no race cars, just uh, products. And the first one, uh, it is the first Alpha car manufactured in 1910. Uh, in 1910, with uh, a 42 horsepower and a top speed of uh, 100 km per hour, so 63 miles per hour, was uh, the top of the range of Italian production. Uh, 300 of them were sold and uh, Alpha immediately was a successful company uh, uh, on the Italian and European automotive market. Then, uh, during the, the First World War, no demand for cars, uh, and Alfa, Alfa start to, uh, to have a crisis, uh, start to close. And uh, a young manager coming from Naples, Nicola Romeo, took the control of the plant, uh, producing compressors. But during the war, we were used to excave the trenches uh, uh, in Italy. Uh, that was a great business for him, he gained a lot of money during the war, but at the end of the war no demand for compressors and he restarted the automotive production. First with pre-war cars just uh, renewed and then with uh, uh, some new projects. And the first uh, really new project was the RL. Uh, the RL, it is the uh, pre-war bestseller. Uh, most of them were sold uh, on the international market uh, through, uh, basically through Alfa Romeo UK that was selling cars all around the world. This, uh, for instance, was originally sold in India and then discovered in Pakistan uh, in 1971 when the, the engine was used for a water pump and, uh, and, uh, and the body work was scrapped. Uh, it's a horse, uh, uh, probably the original uh, owner uh, has to have a horse, it's not a typical design, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's very strange, but every car at, at the time was a one-off, uh, Alfa Romeo was producing only the rolling chassis and not the, the body, and so the customer was free to choose whatever he wants for his car. After the RL, a new project arrived with the 6C family, and the uh, 6C uh, started in uh, 1928, uh, winning the Mille Miglia with a 1.5 liter engine. Then with a 1.75, uh, they start succeeding, and the uh, 175 became uh, uh, a, a true icon of the early 30s, uh, winning the Mille Miglia, winning uh, the Tourist Trophy, and winning a lot of uh, Concours d'Elegance. Uh, this car was uh, uh, sold by it and not, uh, and not Milano, as usual. Cars were exported as a CKD uh, in Paris and then uh, reassembled and sold as French products. In the 30s, uh, Alpha started to divide uh, the production in uh, two models, uh, both with the same displacement, uh, 2.3 liters, but with a six cylinders engine are uh, smooth and comfortable Grand Tours, while with the same displacement but an eight cylinder engine, eight inline engine, uh, they were through hypercars. The 8C 2300 was a car able to win four times the Le Mans 24 hours, three times the Mille Miglia, three times the Targa Florio, and also some uh, Grand Prix uh, in F1 category. Because Alfa Romeo always, uh, al almost always uh, won the debit race, but not with this car. Uh, because the 750 won the debit race, the AC29 the debit race, the Alfetta the debit race, uh, but not the AC2300 that uh, uh, retired for tire problems uh, in the first million in 1931. But after that uh, uh, failure, mm, is one of the most victorious cars ever. So uh, during World War II, Again, no automotive production. Uh, Alfa Romeo was focused on the engines for aircraft uh, and guns uh, and other items production. Uh, and very few cars uh, were manufactured during the war. Very few means uh, uh, six cars uh, in four years. So uh, almost nothing. But uh, immediately after the war, Alfa Romeo had again the same problem. A lot of employees, more or less 10,000, and nothing to produce. 
at first they start uh, uh, producing pre-war cars uh, with newer body. And this, uh, the Freccia d'Oro, that is the Golden Arrow, was the first uh, uh, Alfa Romeo production after the war. But Alfa Romeo realized that uh, it's necessary to change the positioning uh, and to start creating mass production cars in a premium segment. One step back, in the pre-war years, Alfa Romeo was producing 220, 250 cars per year with a positioning that uh, was uh, much higher than Ferrari nowadays. So uh, the average price of an Alfa Romeo was equivalent uh, to uh, more than 200 uh, uh, Italian salaries. So we are speaking about a, a very uh, luxury production. After the war, it was necessary to create uh, a production in larger number, and so uh, they start uh, designing the Mille Nove. The Mille Nove is the first with, with a unibody construction, is the first uh, four-cylinder engine car, is the first manufactured on a production line and no longer uh, handcrafted. Uh, 18,000 were sold. 18,000 is not a so large a number now, but at that time was more than all the Alfa Romeo production in the 40 years before. And so it was the start of the transformation of Alfa from a workshop to an industry. Is this the first emergence of the Alfa Grille? Uh, it's not uh, the very first uh, because in the pre-war the Alfa Grille was just a choice. Uh, some designers used to put it and some others no. The uh, big transformation was with the Milenov, because the Milenov, uh, it is a pressed steel uh, structure, and the poor quality of the steel in the uh, early years after the war and the poor conditions of the machinery weren't able to produce edges or to produce flat surfaces. At the end, uh, all the cars are very similar one to other. If you see the 1950 Fiat uh, 1.5 liters, uh, has more or less the same uh, body shape. And so in order to recognize the brand, it was necessary to create a face. And uh, the Alpha face became the Trilobo with uh, the shield and the two lateral intake. While if you think other brands uh, uh, invented other faces. That was a consequence of the uh, production limits. And the Milanova was available in different versions. Uh, the, the sedan version was manufactured uh, in-house uh, uh, in an internal production uh, line, while the coupe version of the Spider version was manufactured uh, by external code builders. In fact, this is a coupe uh, with a Touring Superleggera aluminum uh, bodywork. Touring Superleggera was producing the, uh, the coupés uh, while uh, Pininfarina was already producing the cabriolet. Another big transformation uh, was the Giulietta. The Giulietta was nicknamed the Italian girlfriend in the 50s because it was... Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, but it was a very famous nickname in Italy. <laughs> uh, it was uh, uh, one of the milestones of Alfa Romeo in terms of numbers because uh, uh, 180,000 cars were built. So Alfa Romeo passed from 200 cars per year to 600 cars per day in seven years. Uh, you can understand the evolution. But also because the Giulietta for the first time was uh, uh, communicated in a different way. Uh, think about the name. It's no longer a number. In this case, we have a woman name. But also think about the, the colors. Uh, before we have the light gray, medium gray, dark gray, the light blue, medium blue, and here we have the light tomato red, the giallo pagliarino, the space, the light blue. So they start using names for the colors, trying to attract a different kind of public that in Italy uh, was, uh, wasn't so... Uh, uh, wasn't so clear because uh, the motor cars were very technical objects before the 50s. From the uh, Giulietta, we arrived to the Giulia that was presented in 62. And the Giulia, uh, from a technical point of view, it's the evolution of the Giulietta, while the bodywork was completely new, both in terms of aerodynamics. The car now looks uh, boxy, but uh, at the time uh, the car had uh, a CD of 0 0.34. 0 0.34 was still good in the 80s. Just to have an idea, the Ferrari 250 GTO was uh, 0 0.42. Uh, so this was much better. And the Giulia was also the first uh, European car with a progressive deformation structure. So uh, in 1962, uh, the car was able to pass the crash tests that were introduced in the 70s. So for uh, 15 years, uh, the car was manufactured without any modification of the project uh, being compliant with the uh, regulations. 
and making the car extremely profitable for sure. Alpha arrived in the 70s uh, with a, a very optimistic uh, idea because uh, the Giulia was a success. Ares was a, a new plant, Pomigliano d'Arco new plant. Balocco private track was uh, just open. But in the 70s, we had the oil crisis, the first regulation about emissions, the first regulation about uh, uh, fuel consumption and safety. And uh, this uh, sum of uh, crisis and condition start to create uh, a, cri a crisis for a uh, sports uh, brand. And so the, the Montreal that uh, was originally presented as a concept uh, in 1967 was manufactured three years later when the world was already changed and only uh, 2,500 2, cars were sold. Uh, this was the, the dream, I can say, while the reality were the Alpha Sud, the first front-wheel drive Alpha, and the Alfetta with its uh, transaxle uh, uh, layout with the engine in the front and clutch gearbox and inboard disc brakes in the back. Um, the Alpha Sud is a C-segment sedan that is still now the Alfa Romeo bestseller with one million cars sold. And uh, the, Giulietta was a, the Alfetta was a commercial success as well, but obviously uh, losing part of uh, um, uh, the profitability of the previous years. In fact, uh, in the 80s, Alfa Romeo started to have a crisis, but in 1986 uh, uh, was uh, impossible to, to fix. And uh, uh, Alfa, that was a stay home company since 1932, was sold to Fiat Group, that started the restoration of the company. Um, the, the V8 that was in that hydro boat up there. Was, was that a Montreal motor? Uh, yes, uh, that, uh, that boat set a record in 69 uh, with uh, a, a race uh, V8 uh, from uh, Tipo 33. Okay. okay. Uh, and then they, uh, they tried another record with the Montreal engine, but then they decided to, uh, um, to retire. <laughs> In the 80s, uh, uh, Alpha uh, uh, first uh, was producing uh, the old Alfetta chassis with a new body called the 75 because in 85 was the 75th anniversary of Alpha. In uh, US was sold as Milano. Uh, and then uh, they first presented the 164 uh, based on a shared platform with the Fiat Chroma, Lanciatema and Sub 9000. Uh, the first E-segment sedan front wheel driven. Then we have a, a real milestone that is the uh, 156. Uh, 156 was a milestone in terms of design, in terms of technology, and also in terms of sales because uh, 60,000 cars were sold before, before the first one is delivered. So um, it, it was a great boost in Alfa history. And we are closing our timeline uh, with a car that now is a 20 years old car, the 8C. This is uh, the concept of AC Competizione that was presented in Frankfurt in 2003. This is a 2004 uh, uh, unit. So I hope you guys are uh, <laughs> sticking with me for this. It's kind of a non-edited draw and, uh, like I said, non-edited version of this tour. Uh, but it is fascinating to see uh, the evolution of Alfa Romeo. And I think we're getting into some of their special cars here. Uh, because uh, this is certainly not something that you see every day. The second section of the museum is called Bellezza. As I told you, we decided to, uh, to keep it in Italian. And uh, there are different areas. This area we, uh, is called the Master of Style, and we speak uh, 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 about how the shape of cars changed through the years and through uh, concept cars. So we have the dream of an Italian nobleman that in 1913 wanted to have a, a car with a, a, a drop shape, uh, just to be aerodynamic. Uh, the car was actually um, faster than the same car with a normal body, but was an undrivable because the engine is inside the cabin. And so you have the smoke, you have the noise, you have the, uh, the oil. <laughs> uh, and so the, the, the owner has to have the car cut in two after one week. And then we have other examples of uh, uh, great design innovations. For instance, in 52, Alfa Romeo presented uh, the Disco Volante, the flying saucer. But uh, uh, it is inspired by the idea of the space, of uh, the spaceship. 
Mm, it is. Actually, it was uh, Max Hoffman, the California importator of, um, of Alfa Romeo, that asked Alfa to create something, uh, to create a, uh, a lightweight sports car inspired by, uh, by the space. Uh, five prototypes were built. Uh, we have here uh, two. Uh, this uh, spider version, the coupe version, but at the end uh, they decided to focus on the Giulietta production uh, and all the strange products were just abandoned. It always looks like it's got a bad enough tire. <laughs> the wheels look too small. <laughs> This is a, a prototype designed by Bertone uh, in, um, uh, in 1965 uh, in order to replace the normal Giulia GT designed by Bertone as well. Uh, but actually the Giulia GT was selling well at the time and so Alfa Romeo thought that uh, it was necessary to replace it and remain just a prototype again. Uh, Montreal ideas came from this, yeah? Yeah, but it was the same designer because uh, Marcello Gandini was the Bertone chief of design at the time and uh, in the same uh, two or three years uh, he designed the Lamborghini Miura, the Montreal of this car and more or less always uh, with the same uh, uh, line of, uh, of the door. Here we have uh, three uh, chassis of the uh, 33 Stradale, of the 33 Stradale, with uh, uh, different interpretations. We have here the Cuneo. Cuneo uh, is, uh, in Italian, is a wedge, because obviously it's a perfect wedge. Then we have an interpretation by Giugiaro, the Iguana, and another interpretation by Pininfarina, with uh, a different approach. But in our collection, we have uh, two more. One is uh, another Bertone, uh, it's a late uh, interpretation in 76, so it's an origami inspired uh, bodywork. And the other is the Carabo that uh, you have seen or probably you will see in the, in the Milano city center displayed. Last, the nuvola. Nuvola in Italian means uh, cloud. It is a concept car presented in uh, 1996 uh, and uh, it wasn't based uh, on any chassis. It was just a design, con a pure design uh, uh, concept. Uh, everything is a tribute uh, to uh, very uh, important Alfa Romeo design elements. The wheel rims, the circular shape of the lights, the handles, the body, and also the color. This is a, a six-layer color that can pass from dark blue to golden, uh, depending on the light. Uh, and it is a modern interpretation of the light blues of the pre-war cars, like the one you see uh, downstairs. Who was the designer? Uh, it was the Centro Stile Alfa Romeo. At the time, it was driven by uh, Walter de Silva. In this room we are speaking about uh, the late 30s, because in late 30s the Italian coach building tradition uh, was uh, probably reached the edge, because it was the, uh, the perfect combination of design, aerodynamic uh, and, uh, and crafting skills, because all these cars uh, were uh, aluminum bodied, uh, with uh, uh, aluminum panels just wrapped around the tubes of the frame. The complete bodywork uh, weighs only 120 kilos included the interiors. Here we have the evolution of the 6C uh, Berlinetta, 38, 39, and this is a post-war interpretation, uh, 49. This car was presented as a special body in the 1949 Villa d'Este Concours d'Elegance, and after winning the uh, the Villa d'Este Cup uh, was uh, named Villa d'Este uh, Bodywork. <laughs> I 
This is a cooperation with Casina. We have to have a, a chair made with the same colors of this car. So light blue with <laughs> beige interiors. The AC2900 uh, is uh, probably the most expensive, uh, sophisticated car Alfa Romeo has ever produced. It was based uh, on the Grand Prix car of the same year with a uh, transaxial uh, platform, the gearbox is in the back, uh, uh, eight cylinder in line with uh, two compressor uh, completely in magnesium alloy. Uh, this car won the Mille Miglia 10 years after the production. And, uh, uh, even now is one of the most collectible Alfa Romeo. One axle right in front of the Yeah, no, no hovering. <laughs> Made a research uh, and we found more than 500 movies with an Alfa Romeo <laughs> in, a, in a protagonist role, not just uh, appearing there, but it is uh, impossible to have all of them because we have to pay the rights. <laughs> We choose 12. In the room, we, uh, we have seen the, the, the sparkling version, so the, the spider version of the Giulietta and of the Giulia, while here we have uh, an idea of the range of the Giulietta and then of the Giulia, with uh, the Sprint Coupe, the Sedan, the Extra Series by Bertone, the race version of the Giulietta, and again, the sedan, even if this is a T Super, but is a ready to race uh, version of a sedan. And then the race car, the TZ, the Coupe, the Giulia GT. This is a one off uh, that was, uh, uh, was built just for the visit of the uh, Italian president here in Arese. Arese it is a huge plant, uh, it was necessary to have something to drive around. And then the uh, GT by Zagato an extra series. Yeah, it was just, just, it was the dream of a, of a, of a nobleman here from Milano that wanted to have a drop-shaped car in order to be aerodynamic. The car was actually aerodynamic, but the engine is inside the, the, the cabin and you have noise, you have uh, uh, smoke, uh, you have uh, heat, and so uh, the original customer has to have the car cut in two after one week. Oh. And this was uh, rebuilt uh, <laughs> after is, the war. Is, is there a name for the Alfa Romeo red that you see in all the cars? Is there a specific name for that color, for the red color? Um, red, it's the Italian color. So uh, since uh, the Gordon Bennett Cup uh, in 1900, uh, all, the Alfa, all the Italian cars uh, must race with the red. Uh, in the pre-war, um, there wasn't a, an Alfa red. Every car was painted red manually in a different tone of red. Uh, finally, in the post-war, in the early 50s, uh, Alfa decided uh, choose one red, the AR501, that became the Alpha Red, that is a bit darker than the Ferrari Red and far different from the other brands red. But only in the 50s we have an Alfa Romeo Red. The code changed in the years, but even nowadays the Alfa Romeo Red is very similar to the Alfa Romeo Red of the 50s. Thank you. Yeah, it's almost uh, candy apple red. I think this is the uh, race car section of the museum. Quite dramatic here. Uh, it's dark, uh, loud sound, all the cars are red. Uh, this is the, mo the most passionate room of a museum. <laughs> it was um, a cover that was used only uh, during the day for uh, aerodynamic reasons and to protect the lights from the stones. Then in the night they remove it. Thank <laughs> you.
cross in the Alfa Romeo badge. Mm -hmm. I thought that kind of dated back to the Crusades. Yeah, uh, it is now. It is uh, the, still the the symbol of the municipality, but it's coming from the Crusade. Yeah. But the, the snake as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. All, all the symbol coming from that period. And where does the Alfa name come from? Alfa, it is the acronym of Anonima Lombarda Fabbrica Automobili. Ah. It is the legal entity. That means just uh, uh, automotive manufacturer. Yeah. Okay. It isn't a name. Hmm. Here we are in the speed section. Uh, also here we have different areas uh, and we are speaking about uh, the most important races in between the two wars. So we start from the, the RL Targa Florio, that uh, it is the first car with a clover leaf painted on it. Because in 1923, exactly 100 years ago, uh, Alfa Romeo team decided to paint a clover leaf as a good luck charm, or, or at least a, a way to recognize the official cars uh, on the car. After the victory of the Targa Florio, that at that time was the most important international race, uh, the Clover League was painted on all the race cars, uh, and then from the 60s became uh, the symbol of the top of the range of the normal production. But here we have a P2 that in 25 won the first uh, uh, Grand Prix World Championship. Mille Miglia 1930, uh, Le Mans 1931, Italian Grand Prix 1931, uh, German Grand Prix 1934, uh, European Championship 32, Vanderbilt Cup 36. And here behind we have uh, the two uh, uh, <laughs> crazy monoposto single seaters uh, uh, with the two engines. In this case we have the engine side by side with the left engine driving only the left wheel and the right engine the right wheel. So. To go straight, uh, you need to perfectly set up the two engines for sure. And to turn, you have to stop the internal engine because there is no differential. To turn with only the external engine on uh, and then to restart on the straight. And at that time, uh, races are with one driver only and lasting at least 10 hours. So uh, the limit was uh, uh, the reliability of the car and the person. This other car, uh, again with two engines, one in the front, one in the back. Both the engines are connected to one clutch and one gearbox, uh, so it's a real wheel drive car. With a total uh, output of uh, 540 horsepower and a top speed uh, of 360 km per hour. You can see the, uh, the Ferrari badge because Enzo Ferrari in 1920 debuted as an Alfa Romeo driver using that car. After being a driver, he became uh, a, an Alfa Romeo dealer for the central part of Italy and a very important um, person in the Alfa Romeo management. In 1929, Ferrari founded the Scuderia Ferrari that was a private racing team that then became, uh, starting in 1934, the Alfa Romeo external but semi-official racing department. In 1937, Alfa Romeo decided to buy the Scuderia Ferrari to move everything in Milano with the name of Alfa Corse and uh, uh, Enzo Ferrari was appointed as the head of Alfa Corse but losing his freedom, I can say, Enzo Ferrari decided to leave Alfa Romeo after nine months and, uh, uh, but we are in the middle of the war, basically and uh, Enzo Ferrari founded uh, his own company with the name Ferrari only in 1947 but from 1934 to uh, 1937, we have Alfa Romeo cars raced by Scuderia Ferrari. Before uh, all the races were stopped uh, and the Alfa Romeo cars uh, were hidden out of the city in order to avoid the bombings uh, and the other problems uh, typical of the war. Alfa Romeo plant was bombed four times during the war, but no race cars was destroyed uh, because they are uh, uh, out of, uh, of Milano. After the war, they, uh, they came back to the plant, they were set up, and in 1950, uh, Alfa Romeo, winning 11 races on 11, won the first uh, Formula One World Championship with El Fett and Nino Farina. In 1951, another victory uh, in the Formula One World Championship uh, with uh, uh, Juan Manuel Fangio and uh, the Alfetta 159. That uh, was the evolution of the 158. This is uh, another prototype uh, that was developed just before of the war 
uh, with a mid-engine flat 12, 1.5 liters uh, uh, supercharged. It is the first uh, uh, square engine in the world with the same boring stroke, 54 millimeters. And in, the, in 1939, the engine was revving at 11,000 RPM. So uh, uh, it was the, the highest power ever reached before the war, the specific power, power per liter, or power per liter. Did it ever race against an Audi or an what are the you know an Audi Union cars? <laughs> no, this car never raced because the car was completed in uh, in 1940. Then the war st stopped uh, the motorsport championship. After the war, uh, the car uh, was innovative but uh, never set up as was uh, undrivable. And so Alfa Romeo decided to pick a lot of innovations like the suspension, the twin stage blower, uh, the vables uh, and other parts, uh, and to evolve the Alfetta. The, the more traditional fat and winning the championship. Huh. Somebody didn't give mid-engine quite enough of a chance. But uh, mid-engine in the pre-war was uh, pretty challenging to drive. <laughs> the Alfetta it is a, a, a eight cylinder in line, one and a half liter, 450 horsepower, and a top speed of 306 km per hour. And with a fuel consumption that is incredible because the car can run 300 meters with one liter of fuel. And uh, is running on uh, a strange mix uh, of uh, ethanol, methanol, uh, uh, benzol, water, and oil. Uh, that is necessary because the, the, the engine is so tuned up that uh, requires strange fuels. This is to keep stuff out of the driver's face. What? These little fender things? Yeah, just fenders. Because uh, um, uh, in the first race of 1951 season, it was raining, and so we decided to put the, the fenders on the car. But uh, you can see uh, in the pictures the car race uh, with or without the fenders. Uh, no aerodynamic mm, function at all. I think it's pretty hot over here by the exhaust, I'm thinking. Yeah. <laughs> Don't want to put your hand on that, huh? <laughs> yeah, it is a... Uh, uh, nice it, uh, it was an asbestos protection. Yeah, a little uh, bit, yeah. <laughs> yeah like no, your, it's not like an asbestos. I like that you're just straddling the drive shaft. Too. Yeah, I know, is that crazy? Don't want a, don't want a center bearing to go out with you while you're driving. <laughs> I can tell you that only one driver had the, the, the legs cut by the shaft. <laughs> but, yeah, but not on a car, on a speedboat powered with the uh, Alfetta chassis. And, but this is, uh, it, it, it is challenging to drive because the pedals are inverted, so you have uh, 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 the accelerator in the middle, uh, and, and again, and then it's very complicated to drive. <laughs> give you a padded headrest. Safety first. I want that upholstery in my personal car. This is, it was normal because now we are used to see uh, leather seats, uh, but uh, leather was slippery. Uh, velvet was much, was much better to drive. And then the car has no firewall, so uh, when you drive, uh, uh, your legs are extremely hot. In fact, uh, if you have some problem, you can open this, and these two ducts are arriving directly on the pedals. Because now if you, if you drive with rubber shoes, you have uh, the, the shoes melted on the pedals. Wait, what does that do? Oh, it it's an end but uh, not for the engine. One is the engine the to cool the pedals, the feet. Can you reach over open that? <laughs> <laughs> That's the same car, Nate. This is the last version. When you start, you have 332 liters of fuel on board. It's a the Dion axle, but reversed. Alfa Sudeltum, la 33, la de 1967.
Uh, 200 more cars and these cars are now stored in our collezione area, our storage rooms and uh, we can have a, a quick tour before uh, dinner just to have an idea. Oh, really fast, <laughs> yeah. Sure. Alright, so we get to go to the vault now, huh? Oh, here we go. Into the vault. Yes. Wow. Don't see that too often, a wooden engine. I know that red's incredible. Okay, this is the collezione area. Uh, we have two floors with 200 cars, 400 engines, uh, models from the design center, from the wind tunnel, equipment, uh, trophies, uh, uh, mock-up parts. Uh, so, uh, and also all the panels uh, you see around the, around the place uh, are the panels uh, of the uh, museum before the restoration. So this is also the museum of the museum. Uh, there are 18 sections here. The cars are divided in sections, but actually, uh, this is a place where we work, where we maintain cars, so we move, uh, we swap cars for the display, and so it's a uh, part of our workshop. Uh, you can find here a lot of uh, uh, cars that uh, are production cars because we are still collecting cars for of, uh, current production. We can find uh, prototypes, uh, we can find design concepts, uh, and cars with uh, uh, unique histories uh, uh, because maybe they are cars that won a race or make a uh, a raid or camouflage prototype. So this is the place where all the secrets uh, uh, of the Alfa Romeo history are, dis are displayed. Part and part. What's the secret of this uh, four C? This is, the red is unusual. no. The, uh, this is the concept of a four C that was presented in uh, 2011. Uh, the car was originally presented in, uh, uh, in matte red, then was repainted uh, uh, in this very deep red for the Villa d'Este Concorde de Gans. And the other 4C, it's a pretty serious 4C that in 2013 set the record at the Nürburgring uh, for uh, cars uh, under 250 horsepower. And the wood? This is a wooden mock-up of the Alfa Romeo V10, that V10 you see there. Uh, um, producing uh, wooden mock-ups just to see how uh, the, the engine behave uh, in, the, in the chassis is normal, but at the end of the project, uh, instead of uh, uh, wasting it, uh, they decided to, mm, to clean it and to paint and became... But I can't steal it. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that, a rotary. I did not know Alfa Romeo made a rotary engine, but apparently, there it is. <laughs> that is a crazy gold color, huh? Look at that. Huh. That's the last uh, car based on the Stradale. It was manufactured in 76, 10 years after the uh, Stradale production by Bertone. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's another <laughs> point of view. <laughs> the Lorian might still work here, right? Exactly. You gotta admit, Nick, the martini livery is. Yeah. Oh. 
The martini livery is like one of the most beautiful. So is that, are those all three BTM cars? Or like no, only this one. Um, this is, uh, uh, this is a, um, a Giro d'Italia car that is a 75 uh, Group A FIA, but uh, prepared with uh, IMSA, uh, with American regulation because of the Wolf-Wackham in the, in, the, in the race. This is a European uh, Touring Car Championship uh, 1998 car, and this is uh, an ITC, so it is the uh, international touring car category that uh, was using the DTM uh, regulation, that it was very open. But in 1996, uh, a car like this uh, um, was uh, as expensive as an F1. Uh, the single car and also the program was very similar. So uh, an F1 team uh, in the middle of the field uh, was uh, investing the same money of a top uh, team uh, in ITC championship. And uh, without the media coverage, uh, the championship uh, was, uh, the championship disappeared mm. in 1996. All the teams re retired. Is that another concept? <laughs> so some of you guys have heard us talk about the fact that Catali came from the original concept car in 2019, and there it is. It's remarkably like a production tonight. <coughs> yeah. Four floor, if you're up for it. All right, okay. we got to go. Let's do it to the uh, to the secret secret vault. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank you. It smells like old cars. Hard to put you guys in here, but you know the smell of uh, rubber and oil and gasoline. Kind of mixed together, that's what it smells like in here. So what's the most valuable Alfa Romeo ever? What's the one that sold for the most? Oh, the 100% uh, is the AC2900. Okay. Uh, and 30 were built. Now the, um, the starting price, it's uh, around uh, 25 million. Wow. Uh, some special bodies can exceed 100 million. Do you have one here? Do we see one? We have two. Yeah, one okay. was the light blue long car. The light blue, okay, uh, yeah. yeah. And the other one now uh, is, uh, is not in the museum. We have uh, a one-off special built just for Le Mans uh -huh. that probably can be one of the most expensive cars mm. ever.